1st of July marked the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party. In this episode, in partnership with LSE Ideas, the London School of Economics foreign policy think tank, we speak with Jonathan Fenby, who is affiliated with the China Foresight Program at LSE Ideas. Jonathan is also the renowned author of The Penguin History of Modern China and the former editor of the South China Morning Post. In this episode, Hannah speaks to Jonathan about the significance of the milestone for the party, looking back at the establishment and the challenges it's faced along the way. Jonathan, a hundred years ago when the party was established, it faced a number of challenges from the conception to maintaining its hold on power, such as uh, civil war, war with Japan, the Great Leap Forward, protests in Tiananmen Square, and the list goes on. How has the Chinese Communist Party managed to uh, maintain a grip on power during that time? Well, uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and if I start by going back uh, on the history, what happened 100 years ago in Shanghai was the foundation of the Chinese Communist Party. And it was pretty small, pretty marginal at the time. There were reckoned to be only 50 to 60 uh, members of the party uh, at its launch, and only a dozen uh, attended the Congress uh, in Shanghai. Uh, the Communist Party then allied with the Kuomintang uh, of Sun Yat-sen, and then Chiang Kai-shek, um, which was established in uh, Guangzhou, uh, known uh, in the West then as Canton, uh, in the South. And that uh, cooperation coalition lasted until 1927, when Chiang Kai-shek turned on the communists and launched what was known as the White Terror, with a purge to try to wipe out uh, the party. Uh, and this led to the uh, fragmentation of the party into bases and the Long March uh, in the mid-1930s. And uh, eventually, uh, the communists under Mao Zedong uh, found refuge in a base in northern China. But during those years, um, up to uh, an alliance with uh, the Kuomintang against the Japanese uh, who had invaded uh, China, that alliance um, saw the communists in a pretty marginal uh, position, it must be said. Um, then came the civil war uh, after the defeat of Japan in 1945, um, which uh, again the Kuomintang uh, began with military superiority, a much larger army, American uh, support and control of more of the country. Although the long war with Japan since 1937 uh, had undermined uh, Kuomintang nationalist rule in many ways. And it was not until 1949 and the victory uh, in the civil war, which was a military and political victory with uh, the People's Liberation Army proving superior to the Kuomintang forces uh, across the country. It was not until 1949 that the communists came out on top. So uh, we have to put this, uh, if you like, this historical uh, narrative back to post-1949, when undoubtedly there was a feeling that uh, China, a new China uh, was being created, was being born. But the Communist Party carried with it into power uh, lessons which it had uh, taught itself or learned uh, during the long years of marginalization and the buildup of Mao's power in the base in northern China uh, during the 1940s in particular. And those put the party, the Communist Party, at the very core of the system. And that's what we've seen uh, ever since, and uh, even a strengthening of that uh, under the present leadership. Uh, and that, that centrality of the party and the narrative that only the party can create the new China and give China the strength uh, that it uh, aspires to, uh, really underlies the ability to overcome the historical disasters to which uh, you referred uh, in your question. Um, and, and that really, the, the Communist Party is insisting that it is the only 
uh, vehicle by which China can become great again. Uh, and if that includes uh, episodes, uh, disasters such as the Great Leap Forward, uh, so be it. This is part of the march uh, towards progress. And today we have this centrality of the party lying uh, at the foundation of the whole leadership, the whole approach uh, of Xi Jinping. As she has said on a number of occasions, uh, East, West, North, South, the government, society, the military, the party leads all. Mm. So as you said, Jonathan, the first 50 years were quite difficult for the Communist Party, but since the establishment of the PRC, they've amassed uh, an incredible level, level of power. And when we're, when we're looking at the party today, the modern um, concept of the Chinese Communist Party, what do you think are going to be its biggest challenges? Do you think they'll come from outside of China or do you think they're more likely to come from within? Well, they cut internally, the challenges will continue. Uh, the whole question of the political system, uh, how far a one party system can, uh, in fact, rally the uh, allegiance um, of the people. The party is huge, it must be said. There are some 90 million members, plus another 100 million or so in the Youth League. There are more than 4 million party cells in organizations, everything down to uh, sports clubs uh, and so on. Um, and the army, the PLA, which is a very important uh, actor in China, is loyal to the party. It is a party army and Xi Jinping uh, lays great stress on the, the, the link between the party uh, and the military. Um, at the same time, since Deng Xiaoping's reforms were launched at the end of the 70s, uh, the party has relied on economic growth uh, and increasing prosperity as one of its great, great claims uh, to rule. And uh, there are problems with the economy, uh, with imbalances in the economy, with the buildup uh, of debt, um, with the uh, reliance on investment. There is the environment uh, where growth has brought huge environmental problems. There's, uh, there are elements such as the shortage of water, uh, particularly uh, in Northern China. There's the demographics, uh, where China is getting steadily older, the population, without uh, a strong pension system, and the birth rate uh, has been falling off. We've had the recent move to allow uh, three children uh, in a family, which show uh, the concern that that is raising um, at the very top uh, in China. There's the whole question of urbanization, of migrant labor, uh, of inequality, um, and of uh, educational uh, standards. So China it has a lot of these domestic problems, but externally, um, there's no doubt, I think, that the drive to establish China's uh, stronger position in the world, which we've seen in recent years from uh, under Xi Jinping, uh, that that is raising uh, increasing uh, opposition uh, across the world, uh, doubts and questions, uh, not just in the United States uh, and not just with Donald Trump. This is continuing uh, We're under Joe Biden. The American desire to, um, see, the American seeing China uh, as a rival, a strategic competitor, um, which has to be dealt with now. And increasingly, we're getting that feeling in Europe, uh, in other parts of East Asia. So the external um, challenges that China will face to what Beijing wants to be its rise in global presence will continue and will be a, a big uh, element in the coming years. But at the same time, um, that internal strength of the Communist Party and the assertion of China's place in the world externally are, I think, linked very closely indeed. Uh, and uh, I don't expect uh, them to the, the, that link to be undone uh, anytime soon.